And if I can just put in a plug, you probably wouldn't be surprised if you were here this afternoon that I'll have a book coming out this summer called Reflecting the Image, which um, I'm excited about that one as well. But um, boy, what a privilege to be here with all of you today. I have thoroughly enjoyed this opportunity, and, uh, and I'm just grateful. And thank you so much, Don. It has been a privilege to get to know you and to work with you these last few years, and for Scott Daniels and for for these opportunities. It's just great. And um, I just really feel at home here. And I've met a number of people today that we've known each other throughout the years. Um, and it's, it's just a, a great privilege to be here together. Well, in the first lecture today, I, uh, I focused primarily on the kenosis theosis parabola and the way in which it became the framework for understanding the holy life in Cappadocian thought. And uh, those of you that missed that, I'm really sorry. Yes, we threw math in with theology, and we, you know, kind of had a fun time, I think. I don't know. I think it's fun, but okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So in this portion, I just want us to step back a little bit, and I want you to um, become better acquainted with the people themselves and the lives that they lived. So we're going to look at some historical pieces of this tonight. Um, one of the goals of my study and... Uh, all of this that I've been sharing with you came out of my doctoral research that I did. Spent six years hanging out with the Cappadocians and finding out what was going on in their lives, and it was just a really amazing experience. But one of my, the goals of my study was to find the place of women in church tradition. And I was drawn to the Cappadocians because they took the time to write about the seven women that were related to them. Quite distinctively for their era, they left us with a large volume of work written about the women who were associated with them. Nazianzen's oration number eight, written for his sister Gorgonia, is the first female panegyric which we have on record. Basil writes letters in which we find reference specifically to his grandmother, Macrina the Elder, and also to his mother, Emilia. Nissen writes the hagiographic document on the life of his sister, the life of Macrina or Devita Macrina, as well as on the soul and the resurrection, which is a philosophical document written in Macrina's voice. Nazianzen's panegyrics on his father and his brother also provide us with lengthy details on the life of his mother, Nona. And if you were here this afternoon, she's the drip that hollowed out the stone. But in these different accounts, these men make reference to the influence of these women on their lives, whether in the development of their theological thought or selection of a vocation. Therefore, not only did they write about the women, but the women directly influenced their theological development. Linda Kuhn comments, the hagiography of female saints replicates the process of redemption by transforming profane female flesh into a vehicle of grace. Women's conversion extends the hope of universal salvation to sinful humanity. So with that, I'd like to introduce you just a little bit to the families and the characters in my story tonight, if I can put it that way. This is an icon and uh, interesting story on this icon. I shared this afternoon that I'd been in Cappadocia and uh, actually I'd been all over in Turkey and I was teaching church history, early church history in that part of the world. And um, my daughter happened to be in class with me. I have two daughters, both of them. Um, have both studied theology. One has a Master's of Arts in Theological Studies from the University of Manchester in England, and the other one is just going to graduate with an MDiv in May. And um, so my younger daughter was on this trip with me, and everywhere I was going, I think I mentioned to you, I kept trying to find my icon of the Cappadocians, and I could only find Peter, Paul, and Mary. So um, it was really frustrating. So I, I kept asking as I was going for, because I just wanted some kind of memory, you know, this trip or whatever. So um, it's the last day. We've been in Turkey, now we're in Greece, and we're in Athens, and um, I go into this antiquities shop, and they do have the Cappadocian Fathers, but um, often you'll find Nazianzen, and uh, Basil the Great and John Chrysostom as the three, and those weren't the three that I wanted. I wanted um, the one with Gregory of Nyssa in it. And, uh, and they wanted $700 for that one. And I thought, mm, no, nope, I'm not buying that one. So we go on down, and my daughter goes into one of these little shops, and she goes in there, and the guy says, what are you looking for? And my daughter says, I'm looking for an icon, and she said, of the Cappadocian mothers. And I thought, yeah, right. I mean, why would you even say that to the guy? And the man said, you mean like Nona? <laughs> and uh, she said, yeah, you know. So he said, well, let me go look. And he goes and he rummages up in his little shop and he comes down with his box and he said, 
I turned in an order for an icon of the Holy Family, and this is what they sent me. This one. <laughs> and he said, you know, I wanted Mary Joseph and the baby Jesus. And he said, and I got this. Well, um, at the top of it, it says the Holy Family of St. Basil. And uh, if you look really carefully at all of it, and I have to, you can't see it very clearly here. But at the top of it is St. Emily. She's the mom. Which I just could not believe that this, this icon was of this family. So mom's up at the top. And then over on the right is big sister Macrina. Over here on the left, I believe, is Theosibia. In the middle, you have Necratius. And then I don't know if I can read the names on them, but you're going to have, well, this is dad. And then you've got um, Peter, Sebast, Gregory of Nyssa, and, and Basil the Great. So um, this was like the whole family that I was studying was all in this icon. And he said, he said um, what if I sold it to you for 50 bucks? Yes. So, so this, is, <laughs> this is my family right here, you know. Um, this was kind of the main family of Basil. And, and this is this amazing story of this family. And so you've got the mother, and you've got one, two, three, four, five, six kids plus the dad. Um, talk about a holy family. Those are all saints, all of them. And so quite the holy family. And um, something that was really fascinating to me is that one of those on that icon is a woman by the name of Theosibia. And uh, as I had started my research on Theosibia, I had actually decided she wasn't going to be a part of my work because everything that I read about her was contradictory. Um, there was a lot of information that said that she was Gregory of Nazianzus's wife. There was other information that said she was Gregory of Nyssa's wife. And then when I got this, I thought, why in the world did she show up in that family's icon? And so to be honest with you, simply by finding that icon, I decided I would research Theosibia more and figure out why, at least from the Eastern Orthodox Church perspective, was she in this family? And there will be the rest of the story, but there is a part of that story. She became part of my dissertation. Um, just to walk you through some of them, Macrina the Elder. This is Grandma. I mentioned her kind of at the end this afternoon. Um, this is the great matriarch of Basil's family. This is a woman that... Um, was a disciple of Gregory the Wonder Worker, who had studied under Origen. This is a woman that um, deeply loved the Lord and had to live in the wilderness for seven years under the final persecutions that happened, um, and was also a wealthy woman. They also had properties, she and her husband. We don't even know the husband's name, but um, Macrina the Elder is a significant woman in the story. This is her um, daughter-in-law, Emilia. Uh, Macrina the Elder, has her husband is a lawyer, and um, Emilia, this young lady, was known for being beautiful. As a matter of fact, they talk about how attractive she was, and that she was an orphan, and we believe she was an orphan because her parents had all died in the final persecutions. Now, you have to understand, this is the end of that era of the persecutions, at the end of, um, of this time when Christianity is being persecuted, and now... It is becoming part of the true Roman Empire. And this is that transition and this change. She's an orphan, um, extremely attractive, and far too many suitors. And so um, Basil, the dad, um, saves her and marries her and brings her into their family. And Emilia, the little orphan, notice uh, the sign that she holds often in her this is a, an icon, obviously, in English, but behold, I and the children which God hath given me, the mother of six children that become saints. So Saint Emily, pretty amazing lady. Um, this is the oldest daughter, Macrina the Younger. She's named for Grandma. And, uh, and she goes on to be the most well-known of all the women in this family. She's known the best because her brother, Gregory of Nyssa, writes her life story. Um, and uh, so we do know a little bit, well, we know a lot more about her than we do about some of the other women. Something interesting about her, I showed at the beginning of the other lecture a picture of the Paul and Thecla cave from... Um, 
from up in Ephesus. Um, right before Macrina is born, there is an angel or whatever comes and visits mom and says, this baby's secret name will be Thecla. And uh, actually, because of that, I spent a lot of time studying Thecla and reading the Acts of Paul and Thecla and all these things. And um, I have this crazy theory that she was the thorn in the flesh. I think she stalked him. And I think that he prayed three times, get this woman to leave me alone. But that's another story. But um, <laughs> so Macrina the Younger, um, she's holding an icon of the three brothers, um, her three brothers. And these are the ones that go on to become bishops. So we've got St. Uh, Basil the Great is the great big brother. <laughs> you've got Gregory of Nyssa, and you've got Peter of Sebast. So those are the three brothers that she holds, and those are the three that become saints. This is the saint brother. Um, this is Necratius. This is another one of the brothers that's part of the family. He does not go on to become a bishop or an official priest or religious leader. He, however, is a very spiritual man, and he's a man that believed that God let him just to kind of go and live off the land. He and his servant, and they were a wealthy family, but they end up, he goes up to the countryside, he um, is a hunter and a fisherman, and he shares his food with all the needy in the community where he, he serves. And Necratius um, dies in a fishing accident. He's out fishing and he's laying these lines along the water and somehow he actually gets caught up in the ropes dragged under the water and drowns, and his servant has to bring him back, um, you know, to the family. And Necratius's death, um, and again, they talk about, uh, this is kind of funny, but over and over they talk about how good-looking this family is. Um, evidently, he was handsome and rugged. Um, but there is a real turning point in the lives of the rest of the kids when Necratius dies. And there's a real turning point in terms of wrestling with what's really important in life, and um, there are people that would argue that Basil, uh, I, I said something earlier about how Macrina had told him that he was puffed up, <laughs> he needed to get his act together, and he really um, commits himself more to the Lord. That letter from her, I guess, comes at about the same time that Necratius dies. So there's some sort of influence in the family about when he dies and their commitment to wholehearted service to God because it, it just changes them dramatically. This is Theosibia. She was the one that I said I discovered on that icon and kind of wondered about her. Um, and my theory is, and, and I think it, it's kind of more accepted now in, last, in the last about four or five years, is that Theosibia was another sibling of the family, a younger sister of Macrina, that uh, when the family moved to the place called Anessi to have their family monastery and serve the Lord there, that Theosibia went there. Um, that later on, when Gregory of Nyssa's wife dies, that Theosibia, the reason it was confusion about who she was, she probably goes to be his assistant in ministry and help him throughout the rest of his ministry. Um, so this is Theosibia, and she is known as the deaconess of Nyssa. And so there, there's some significance there, and we'll talk about her a little bit later. Um, these are the rest of the kids. <laughs> we don't know their names. Wouldn't you like to be the one known as the fallen virgin for the rest of your life? <laughs> it's really sad. There's the fallen virgin. There's another sister and another sister and the baby that died. So those are the, there were 10 kids. Um, and so that's the rest of that family. Then um, let me take you to Gregory of Nazianzus. Now this is really funny, but they never tell you that this family is attractive. And I just want you to know that because you'll, you'll, you'll notice, even in the icons, I find this hilarious. But no, he's not really. And just wait till you see mom and sister. So, um, <laughs> but this is Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, he is the best friend of Basil the Great. And they meet each other when they're at the university in Athens. And I mean, you know, the great school in Athens, that's where these guys went. They walked the streets of Athens. They studied. I mean, it was the best education you could get in the world that day. And, uh, and that's where these boys met each other. He becomes known as Gregory the Theologian. Eventually, um, he is in Constantinople in 381 and actually presides over part of uh, the council meeting until 
Well, I, I think they figured out you're not allowed to be a bishop of two cities at one time, and he was, and so he, there, that becomes controversial, and he gets sent off because he's, he was made uh, the bishop of Nazianzus by his friend Basil, and as a matter of fact, that was one of the most painful things in their relationship. Basil makes ne uh, Gregory his brother and Gregory his best friend take positions in the church for political reasons. Um, they're fighting with the, the Arians, and so they're actually staking out territory physically. And, um, and Gregory of Nazianzus becomes so angry at his best friend Basil near the end of his life, he never talks to him again. Um, it's a real rift, unfortunately, in their relationship. But um, I, I think he says something about, you sent me to some one-horse town to be. Yeah. yeah it's, um, this is Nona, the mom. This is the drip that hollowed out the stone. But uh, Nona for Gregory of Nazianzus is, is really this incredible woman in his life, his mom. Um, his mom is the one that's the Christian to begin with. She's the believer, the dad is not, it was an arranged marriage. And she prays and prays and prays until her husband accepts Christ. And that's why I was joking about, she's known as the drip that hollowed out the stone. He finally gives his life to Christ. They have three children. Um, she has Gregory, they have uh, a daughter, Gorgonia, and a son named Caesarius, and um, just, uh, again, she's an amazing woman. Um, this is Gorgonia. No, this was not the attractive family, and uh, <laughs> so, um, I don't know, I just think it's, but Gorgonia, I know, this is Gregory, <laughs> I don't know, they just actually wrote about this stuff, so this was, um, yeah. So this is the younger sister, Gorgonia, and she's also known as an amazing woman. Somebody asked, you know, about was Mary seen in the Cappadocians as this new Eve, and actually it's Gregory of Nazianzus that writes about his mom, Nona, and his sister, Gorgonia, as for him being the models of the new Eve. So, so that's just a little bit of, of who the players are here. The women who were part of the Cappadocians' lives provided the background and the environment for much of their theology. To understand the men, you have to look behind them to see the equally great women. And while the men have left volumes of their writings, Basil alone has left us four volumes in Patrologia Greca, including 366 letters. We have no firsthand writings from these women. Historically, many women's voices have been lost to us because their stories were never told, or the men whom they influenced never mentioned them. I read somewhere as I was preparing in, in some of my dissertation that you know some people say, well, it's just because they never did anything of significance or it would have been written down. Uh, I mean, the truth is, uh, and, and I was talking to a student recently at a university. They said, well, I'm studying history because it's easy to study history. It's just kind of really black and white. You know, it's all there. And I said, you do know that history is influenced by whoever wrote it down, right? Yeah. And uh, he had never really thought about that. So. So resultantly, for centuries, there's been a vacuum regarding the role which women played in the development of theological thought. And in the case of the Cappadocian Fathers, their theology has, in a sense, been rediscovered by the Western Church in the last half century. And concomitantly, there has been an unearthing of the women in their lives. While Basil, in extant works, never directly referred to his sister Macrina, although I think there might be one place he did, and I'm going to talk about that tonight, he did mention the influences of his mother and grandmother. Let me just say, I think that Basil and Macrina had sibling rivalry. Um, he's the oldest and uh, uh, he's the oldest boy, she's the oldest girl, and um, I don't think he ever wanted to give her credit for influencing his life, I'm just saying. I think that was their personalities, and it's only little brother Gregory of Nyssa that tells us that Macrina had an influence on big brother Basil's life, but um, he only mentions grandma Macrina. It is... Uh, their friend, Gregory of Nazianzus, provides reflections actually on Macrina, Emilia, and Theosibia from Basil's family, and he wrote orations for his own family members, which give us insight into his home life and personal development. Each of the women whose lives are detailed in the writings of the Cappadocians can be seen as models for a portion of the Cappadocians' theological development in regard to deification, and can be presented as illustrations for the stages of theosis. Derek Kruger observed, for Nissen, memorializing the lives of holy men like Gregory Thaumaturgus and holy women like Macrina fills the gap between the present life and the heavenly reality they mediated, a gap that was left empty by their passing. The stories fill the gap, which could not be filled by their theological writings alone. 
F.W. Norris believes that Nazianzen would applaud the use of narrative as the proper form of theology, but would argue that too few of today's contemporary theologians have yet moved beyond the stories themselves to the theologian's drumbeat of narrative bits for the divine and human in Christ, a performance that depended upon those gospel accounts, but in some ways still has more ability to move hearers or readers than they do. In the case of the women, they become the narrative threads which present the concept of deification, moving readers in a practical sense to join the narrative. Wilkin reminds us, without examples, without imitation, there can be no human life or civilization, no art, no culture, no virtue or holiness. Therefore, it's possible to place these female saints related to the Cappadocian Fathers into the framework of the kenosis theosis parabola. While the world saw the Cappadocians arguing theology with some of the greatest minds of their day, undergirding such theological conversation was a foundation of experience within their own homes, which was molding them into the theologians that they became. So what I want to begin with here this evening are the first two parts of the parabola that I talked about this afternoon. Humankind is made in the image of God and is a reflection or a mirror of that image. And part two, the image is tarnished by the fall into sin. And I would like to say that I believe that those two stages can be illustrated by one of the women in the story, which is the fallen virgin, the one that was one of those four other children that was listed. Found within Basil's letter number 46, it's called To a Fallen Virgin, is the, oh, that was just other pictures here. That's life in Cappadocia. It was known as being kind of like the Texas of, uh, yeah. They had a lot of horses and things, and, yep. and that's just another picture of that holy family. Um, so here we go a little bit. We're going to talk about the fallen virgin. It's Basil's letter number 46. It's the description of a young woman who has walked away from her vows of celibacy. It's a rather esoteric dom document that has led to speculation as to the nature of the letter. And previously, it really has not been given much consideration. This is one of those sort of lost letters of Basil that kind of sat in the stacks. And only a few years ago, a woman by the name of Anna Silvis began to dig it out and began to look at it. And I spent time looking at Anna Silvis's work and trying to compare it to some of the things that I was doing and how we could put some of these pieces together. Um, and most people believe that the letter was just simply written to some anonymous virgin. Um, Anna Silvis and I would both argue that it was written to a family member of Basil's. So, um, and according to Anna Silvis, her opinion, this letter directly connects this young woman with Basil the Great. Um, Elm, who wrote The Virgins of God, which is actually a very large piece on, on women um, in antiquity, uh, she, would, she doesn't believe it, but um, I would just disagree with her. <laughs> um, she doesn't think that this is a comment on the family, but rather a description of another family member, possibly that of an aunt or a cousin. Um, and she puts the dating somewhere around 370. Um, however, Silvis provides a compelling argument for the dating of 362 to 63, and the placement of this sister is one of the youngest, born perhaps just before Peter, who was born in 345. This would make the timing of her vows, so this is careful. So if, if, uh, if she's born somewhere around 340, 345, by the time we get to the three, six, early 360s, she might be around 16 years of age, 15 or 16. And it would be about the right time that a young woman would be taking her vows of celibacy. What had happened in the family during this time, let me just kind of tell you. This whole family had been a very wealthy family. They were living in the city of Caesarea. The oldest sister, Macrina, at about the age of 13, was betrothed to marry a young man who was a lawyer. But before they could ever get married, he died. She was very attractive. <laughs> they kept telling us that. And she had many, many suitors. And, um, and her brothers were encouraging her to marry someone else. And finally, she said, no. She said, I'm going to consider this as if it was my marriage. And now I want to give my life wholeheartedly in service to God. And so it is Macrina, the older sister, that becomes the spiritual driving force, if I can say this, of this family in many ways. I mean, she's raised in a great home. I mean, they, they believe in God. They do all this theological training and biblical study at home. But Macrina is the one who finally says, 
you know what, I'm not going to just follow what society says to follow. I am going to live this way. And she is the one that begins to believe that the family needs to, um, to live in a different way. By the time the last kid is born, dad dies, Macrina talks her mother into selling all their family possessions, moving out to, the family had like a country home in the wilderness, to go out there and set up a family monastery. And this, we believe that Macrina kind of sets up the first female monastery in all of history as a result of all of this. Um, they live at the same level with all their servants. They share life together. But as the story kind of unfolds, if you want to imagine, the youngest sister never get 